Carnegie Mellon Vaccination Database Talks are made possible by Ottertune. Learn how to automatically optimise your MySQL and Postgres configurations at ottertune.com. And by the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real. Find out how best to keep it real at stephenmoyfoundation.org. Hi guys, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, this is another session of the, the CMU, or the Carnegie Mellon Vaccination Database Series. We are happy today to have Gian Merlino. Uh, he is the CTO and co-founder of Imply, which is the main startup backing Apache Druid. Um, he's been at Yahoo, he was at MetaMarkets before Imply, uh, and he has a computer science degree from Caltech, uh, which is a small program, so there's not many of you guys out there, so that's awesome. Um, and so as always, please, if you have any questions for Gian as he's talking, please unmute yourself, say who you are and where you're coming from, uh, and again, we want this to be a conversation, so feel free to interrupt at any time. Okay, Gian, the floor is yours. Go for it. Thank you for being here. All right, great. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for thanks for having me. Um, uh, so yeah, so today I'll be talking about Apache Druid, um, and I'll be talking about its storage and query engine, and um, a little bit of uh, how the system all comes together. Um, let's see. Who am I? Uh, I'm Gian Merlino. Thanks for the intro. I'm a, a committer and project uh, PMC chair at Apache Druid, and I'm also co-founder at Imply. Um, if any of you are looking for jobs after you're done uh, learning about databases and you want to work on databases professionally, we are hiring. Um, uh, come talk to me. Um, all right, what are we talking about today? So. Uh, First off, I'll do a brief introduction on Apache Druid. What is it for those of you that are not familiar with it? Uh, talk about the core concept of Druid, which is a segment. Um, it's a uh, it's the core data uh, concept, core data format that everything revolves around. Talk a bit about how data servers work, how a cluster comes together. Druid is a distributed system, and then uh, zoom back in uh, from the the ten thousand foot view of a cluster into the smaller view of the segment file format and how an individual query gets executed. So we'll talk about all levels of the system. Um, it's a it's a complex distributed system with a lot of different zoom levels. So I, I think it's it's kind of interesting to take a little bit of a look at each one of them. Um, so okay, so first off, what is Druid? Druid is a powerful query engine. We like to think of Druid as this rocket ship that goes really fast, um, but that's when we are really just full of ourselves and um, have our head in the clouds. What Druid really is, is a fancy calculator. And it's a system for adding things up really, really quickly, um, counting things, uh, taking mins, maxes, averages. It's, it's a fancy calculator, but people want a fancy calculator on huge amounts of data. Um, being able to do that really efficiently is good. Um, Druid powers OLAP apps. This is the kind of app that you want a big fancy calculator for. Uh, OLAP is uh, online analytical processing, um, just a, a, a term for doing uh, aggregations, filtering, that kind of thing. Mostly very read heavy workloads that hit the entire data set or large slices of it. Uh, you don't tend to be hitting one row at a time. You tend to be hitting uh, large chunks of the data set. Um, and on the right side, it tends to be more insert-based than, than, um, than update-based. So lots and lots of inserts, lots of reads, and big chunks of the data set. It tends to be useful for um, interactive analytic applications where you want to do visualizations, um, like the one you see here. That's one that we make it imply called Pivot. Uh, Jirit also speaks SQL, which is a standard language for doing this kind of stuff, uh, and people build their own apps on top of it. Um, Druid's been around for a while. It's it's enjoys uh, nice use out in the wild. Um, Druid's used at Netflix uh, for uh, analyzing user experience. Used at Twitter Mopub for analyzing uh, data related to online advertising and, and mobile publishing. Use at Salesforce for understanding what their users are doing. Use at Airbnb for analytics on the mobile apps. So use use uh, all kinds of people that have these really big scale problems um, for delivering analytical applications. Um, some numbers from Imply customers. So at Imply, we are one of the big sponsors of Druid. We uh, have a lot of engineers working on it full time. We're certainly not the only company behind it, but we're one of the big ones. Um, and some numbers from Imply customers, uh, petabytes of data under management, thousands of daily active users, millions of rows per second ingested, and very fast query times. All this with uh, 90 percentile query times less than a second, and even 99 percentile query times less than two seconds over the last uh, month or so when I pulled these this morning. Um, so we're, we're running it at really high scale at really high speed. And that's, that's what Druid is, is designed for. Um, and I don't want to, sorry, sorry. For the queries that, for the queries 
doing that cause them to get crushed? Is it just they read a lot of data or is it like they do crazy joins? Like what is it? What is that? Sort of, yeah, go ahead. So it's 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 um it's it's a, a long tail of uh, a variety of stuff. So some of them are doing an percentile. Even even the fast ones generally do read a lot of data. The ones on the slower end, um, it's it tends to be a mix of doing more complicated stuff than is typical. So like a typical query, you know, people really do want a pretty simple stuff. Like I, I over an incredibly large amount of data, I want relatively simple statistic. Um, sometimes we want to know something more fancy that takes more time to compute on a per row basis and that can take longer. Um, and sometimes people want to query more data than typical. So maybe typically you'll be looking at a year of data, but every once in a while you want to do a query over 10 years of data. Okay, All right, thank you. Um, okay, so I didn't want to talk too much about this stuff because this is a internals talk. I just wanted to motivate uh, y'all for why you would want to listen to the next uh, 45 minutes. So let's, let's get into the details. Um, inside Apache Druid. Uh, so, um, I hope that some of you are familiar with this, this video, The Powers of 10, it came out in the 70s. Uh, I, I think I first saw it in my childhood at a science museum and it captivated my imagination. Um, it's a pretty cool video. It's about seven minutes long. If you haven't seen it, check it out on YouTube. Uh, it is a, a video of, of going all the way, uh, zooming all the way out um, from this, this uh, gentleman at a picnic, uh, all the way out to the bounds of the known universe and then zooming all the way in to a uh, proton uh, in a, in a molecule inside one of his cells. And, um, I want to do a similar thing with Druid. I want to start from, uh, sort of a mid level zoom and then zoom all the way out and then zoom all the way in. So let's, uh, let's go on that journey. We'll start off with the segment. Uh, the Druid segment is, like I said, the core concept that everything revolves around. Um, it's got about a million rows in it. So we're at 10 to the six rows. And this is, this is sort of the, the mid level, uh, zoom level for Druid. It's a heavily optimized storage format. Um, it's a columnar format, like like every other analytical database out there. Um, it's you know with with Druid, you're going to get the greatest hits of uh, columnar databases. Um, new segments are created continuously as data is ingested. So uh, every roughly every million rows, every one to ten million rows of new data coming. There are millions or even tens of millions of these segments. Um, they're immutable once created, but they can be dropped, replaced, or combined. And we call combined and compaction. And uh, if you're dropping them, that's like deleting data. And if you're replacing them, that might be what we would do that if you, if you issued an update command. And generally one to 5 million rows each. Um, they have a life cycle. So this is a, a little depiction of the life cycle of a single segment. Um, we in Druid have uh, two node types. One's called the indexer and one's called the historical that interact with these segments directly. The indexer creates them. So it, it reads data, it reads streaming data, batch data coming in. Um, it generates segments. It pushes them to what we, well, it, it does that. It pushes them to what we call deep storage. Um, deep storage is, uh, it's gonna be something like um, S3 or Google storage or HDFS. It's some kind of distributed storage. Um, it's a, uh, Druid occupies, and this, this talk isn't really about the separation of storage and compute, but um, suffice to say that, that, that in the, the sort of, you know, 10 years ago, we had, we had Hadoop coming out saying that, that um, we get all of our speed from co-locating the, the data and the compute. And now we have the newfangled cloud data, uh, cloud data warehouses that are saying that we get all of our versatility from separating storage and compute. Um, and these are both true. It's faster to combine them and it's more versatile to separate them. And, and Druid occupies, I think, a really interesting point on that spectrum um, that we actually get a little bit of benefits of, of uh, both sides of it. But th this talk isn't about that. I just wanted to, to mention it. Um, anyway, we push things to deep storage uh, and then um, other servers pull from deep storage. So deep storage is sort of a, every all data we've ever ingested is gonna be on deep storage. Um, it is going to be pulled, uh, loaded locally uh, by the historical servers. Um, and they do this uh, as a preload before they, um, before a query actually happens. So this is what I mean by the sort of interesting space. Um, when you have systems that completely separate storage and compute, generally things are pulled from storage on demand during a query. 
they might be cached, but they're generally pulled on demand. Um, when you have systems that co-locate uh, fully uh, storage and compute, you tend to have um, data coming into a server and then stays on that server uh, for the long term. Um, in, in Druid, the, the hybrid model we have here is, is the data is not, there's no strong affinity of data to a specific server. So these segment files can float from server to server. Um, and uh, when they're ingested, they end up generally on a different server than the one they came in on. They can be repartitioned, shuffled, all these kinds of things that you would expect from a system where they're separated, where storage and computer separated. Um, but for the one difference uh, that we do pull things um, from deep storage onto the data servers before they're queried. So it's a, it's a prefetch rather than a cache. And that's for performance reasons. So I, um, I think Hamid, Hamid, you have a question, unmute yourself. He's in the chat, but it's yes. me from my, um, where, where is he in the chat? I yeah, hi Andy, question. thank you. Hey, what's up, man? Go for it. <laughs> yeah, so one question is that uh, when you read it, uh, uh, the data from local, so either memory or NVMe, what is the bandwidth of your read, the storage read? Is it like two gigabyte per second or it is 10 gigabyte per second? Um, are you yeah, so we're ready. Go ahead, sorry, go. No, what were we gonna say, Andy? I, think I was, Hamid, are you talking about like, you talking about like the, the imply hosted version of Druid, right? Because it depend, obviously depends on the hardware. Yeah, I mean, you got you got say NVMe. Suppose you have a reasonable, you know, amount of the CPUs, like uh, you know, go extra large version from AWS. So I, I want to yeah. see that you. Um, are... I I actually don't know. I think of it. I tend to think of it more in terms of rows per second than in terms of bytes per second. Um, and those, those are the numbers I have on the top of my head. So in terms of rows per second, for a simple query, you might get a hundred million rows per second per processor. Um, and for a more complex one, you might get, you know, one to 10 million rows per second per processor. Yeah, okay. Uh, so let me ask you differently. Is the, what is the bottleneck? Is that the CPU or is the storage? Not, not the backend of storage, MV, local NVMe or even memory. Yeah, good question. Um, it depends on, um, it depends on how your, your ratios of your storage hierarchy. Um, so typically people with uh, what we call hot data um, will have a ratio of memory to disk that is very high and a ratio of CPU to memory that is relatively low. And in that case, uh, people tend to be constrained by CPU and my memory bandwidth. Um, and which one they're constrained by uh, depends on how good locality is on the data. Um, uh, if, the, if locality is bad, they'll be constrained by memory bandwidth. If it's good, they'll be constrained by CPU. Um, okay, so, and, so you say that if the data yeah. is in memory, you can actually keep up with the memory speed, which uh, is a very really high is, speed. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. that's, so we'll, get, we'll talk about that in a little bit when we talk about how the compression works, but, but we prioritize compression and encodings that can be decoded very rapidly. Okay. So the, the idea is to be able to, the idea is, is to, um, we basically optimize everything for the case where locality is good and where your CPU constrained. And so we, we prioritize uh, things that, that let the CPU fly as fast as it can, but we do tend to be CPU constrained. Okay. So my other question was at some point probably going to answer it that compare this, uh, your offering with the cloud or a Druid. So let's, let's, Hamid, let's do that one at the end, okay? At the end, not now. Sure. Not now. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. All right. Cool. Gene, go for it. Sure. So um, let's see. Uh, okay. So what I, what I was saying is that that there's this interesting spot on the storage compute um, combination or or, or deaggregation spectrum, um, and uh, one of the things that happens here is what we call balancing. So um, you know I mentioned that there is a affinity of data. Uh, of segments to servers, but the affinity is not as strong as a system where uh, where storage and computer are completely linked, um, but it's it's uh, not as loose as one where they're completely separate. And so in a completely separate system, data would get pulled on demand. That doesn't happen in Druid. In Druid, we have a process called balancing um, in order to move data from one server to the other as, as things make sense. And in that balancing process, what happens first is step five in the segment lifecycle is another historical, a different one loads it. Um, and then the original one will potentially drop it. Um, and balancing happens as new data is loaded in an effort to keep load uh, relatively consistent across the data servers. It, it is just a cache though, right? Because like the, the, 
the, the, the storage of record is the deep storage, right? You're, just, you're balancing yes. to say, okay, drop cash here and pull cash up here. Yeah, yeah, we actually, um, in, in the code, we actually call the cache and it, it okay. is a cache. Um, but I find that usually it's sometimes when I call the cache and talk to people, people think that it's a cache that's populated on demand. Um, it's a cache that's populated ahead of time instead of on demand. Sure. That, I mean, I wouldn't call it, it's, it's not a hybrid shared, nothing shared, everything, right? It's, it's or shared, nothing shared disk, right? It's, it's shared disk it's with, with, a, with smarter cash. Yeah, that's, that's sort of how I think about it. Okay, that's fine. Um, uh, and, the, and, and the caches are completely local and we never query from the, if you can think of deep storage as a shared disk, um, that's never involved in the query path. Uh, which is the main difference between what Jordan would do and what something like like Presto or Hive would do is is they might do some caching, but they would also involve they would involve the storage layer in the query path, which Jordan doesn't. Got it. Okay. Um, okay. So that's that's the ten to the sixth level, one million rows. Let's go up one zoom level. Let's go to ten to the um, uh, oh oh my god, I got the wrong thing here. I got okay, fix it in post. Um, uh, the wrong, this, this should be 10 to the 10, not 10 to the 13. Um, inside a data server, 10 to the 10 rows, not 10 to the 13. That would be a really awesome data server. Um, 10 to the 10 rows on a data server. There's, let's talk about the goals of a data server, um, of one data server. So there's the, the two goals revolve mostly around how we want to deal with CPU and memory, or two sets of goals. So for CPU, one goal is we want to be able to harness all available CPUs for a single query, which means everything we do has to be multi-threaded. Um, and another goal is we want to balance CPU usage across concurrent queries in, in some kind of, you know, optimally in, in scare quotes. Uh, who knows what optimal means, but we'll define what we think optimal means in a little bit. Um, and then on the memory side, uh, we want to be able to take advantage of high memory hardware. So if you do have enough uh, memory to hold your entire data set, we want to take advantage of that in an optimal way. Uh, we also want to be able to fall back to disk when memory is insufficient. For the kinds of applications people build on Druid, it's um, Generally, the, the most important uh, part of the application is how does it perform on this hot data, which is generally 50 to 80% memory. So we spend a lot of time optimizing for that case where most of your data is in memory, maybe not all of it, but most of it. Um, and then there tends to be a, a fraction of the use case that is uh, on colder data. And this might be something that's like, maybe the hot data is the past year, like I was saying, and the colder data is the nine years before that. Um, or it could be a table by table basis. It could be certain tables are hot and certain tables are cold. Um, however it is, the typical application built on Druid is mostly hot and some cold. And so we want to be able to handle both of those use cases in one system. All right, now the uh, legend is back to the correct 10 to 10 rows. Um, so let's look uh, inside a data server schematically. So there's these sorts of three layers in, in terms of how we think about what's going on inside a data server. On the bottom layer, we have all the segments on that data server. Um, it could be uh, maxes out at a couple hundred thousand or so. Um, memory map disk. So uh, we, um, like a lot of other systems invented around the time Druid was and, and modern systems today, uh, we rely heavily on memory mapping. It works really well. Um, it, is, it works really well with uh, SSDs, which uh, are pretty popular these days. Um, so it, it, like a lot of modern databases, especially a lot of modern analytic databases, Druid's uh, meant to run on, on SSD backed systems. Um, and so we have all the segments lying on disk, we memory map all of them, and we let the OS figure out what's in the memory and what's not. So we don't actually have code in Jira to figure that out. We just, um, we, we allow the OS to figure it out. Um, above that layer, we have the processing thread pool. There's one thread per CPU. Um, and then we have the processing memory pool. And there is a certain amount of memory we'd allocate uh, per CPU as well. Uh, generally on the order of half a gigabyte to a gigabyte or so. And then the top layer, we have some per query resources. So the, the, the bottom layer is all memory math files. The middle layer is resources that are per CPU. And the top layer is resources that are per query. Um, and let's talk a little bit about how these resources get managed. Quickly, quickly so, for, the memory map, yes. for the memory map files, are you guys doing like mAdvise or like giving the hints to the OS about like with the refresh and things like that? Or are you just letting the OS blindly do whatever it wants? We're doing the second one. Um, we okay. might start doing mAdvise at some point. I think some folks have done some experiments in the open source for Druid, but none of them made it into mainline. Okay, all right. And then for your thread pool, is that just all bespoke code or are you relying on like, uh, like 
we, we, there's the Intel thread building blocks. There's a couple other like scheduler stuff that's out there. You use any of those? Yeah. Um, it's so George written in Java. We are using yeah. mostly uh, the standard thread pool in um, Java Util Concurrent with uh, one change that we added to um, for prioritization purposes, which I could talk a little bit about in a couple of slides. But we, we've okay. changed how it prioritizes tasks that are that are queued up to be processed. The actual the rest of it works the same way as the basic Java one. Okay, thank you. Um, so in terms of the resources, of the server, uh, a, a lot of what we've done in the server to manage these resources is based around prioritization. Um, the, and the reason that's important is because the base design of the system, if you, if you look at the processing thread pool, the memory pool, memory map disk, um, the, the basic design of those layers of the system achieves the first goal I mentioned. It, it achieves the, the goal of enabling a single query to use every CPU if it wants to. Um, because uh, we have a lot of segments. Uh, every CPU, there's there's many more segments than CPUs. You know, the server might have might have 100 CPUs and 100,000 segments. So there's many more segments than CPUs. So if you split up the segments to the CPUs, then um, you get good multi-threading right there. Um, and uh, the issues come in, or the issue in this design comes in when you have concurrent queries and you want to balance resources between them in some fair or optimal way. Um, and and I think about it more in terms of fair, or sorry, more in terms of optimal than fair, because you don't really want to be fair necessarily in a system like this. But you want to do something that the user is going to expect. Um, and that, uh, to that effect, um, we've built a prioritization system inside Druid. And the idea is that uh, most people have um, a variety of workloads they want to put on a system like this. And some of those workloads, they expect to be fast, they expect to be interactive and some they don't. Um, and what we wanna make sure of with the prioritization system is that the workloads that people expect to be interactive remain interactive even when the system is under high load. Um, of course, that's uh, not possible in the general sense without auto scaling, um, which uh, is something that in Apache Jira doesn't exist. Uh, people on uh, top of the Jira have built auto scaling type stuff, but I won't be talking about that today. Um, in terms of the base system that does not automatically scale in the open source, um, it, the um, ability to meet these expectations is mostly built around prioritization. So prioritization, here we have three queries. Uh, two of them are outlined in orange and one's outlined in blue. The orange ones are high priority and the blue one is low priority. Um, there's uh, um, the way that this, the lower levels work is that if we have a bunch of queries in the system, some at higher priority, some at lower priority, the higher priority ones get priority over everything at the lower levels. So they get priority over all, all the CPUs and all the memory pool. Um, so they could, uh, if they wanted to, uh, take all the resources away from the lower priority one, which is generally what people expect to happen. Generally, people expect lower priority work um, to sort of uh, exist in the gaps between high priority work. Um, and in, in practice, this takes advantage of the property that um, the high priority work tends to be uh, pretty spiky. Uh, it tends to be human driven uh, by people clicking around and analytical application. Um, it, 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 it doesn't tend to be space filling. It doesn't tend to fill all the available computation time the system has. Um, and so when there is high priority work happening in that instance, um, we do it. And when there's, no priority, when there's no high priority work happening, then we fill the space with lower priority work that may be around. Um, this extends down to the lower system uh, because the, the segments are all loaded. Uh, they're basically accessed um, as needed. Uh, and um, as these processing threads access areas of the segment, the OS will keep them paged in or a page limit or keep them paged in. Um, and this is also tends to be helpful because it tends to be that the higher priority work and the lower priority work don't always want to access the same segments. They tend to want to access different tables or different time ranges or that kind of thing. Um, okay, so that's, let's see, that's one data server. Let's go up one more level. Um, and talk about how a cluster comes together. So this is, uh, now we're finally really at 10 to the 13. This is 10 trillion rows. This is, um, this is uh, about as, as big as one cluster is gonna be able to get with uh, the design that we have uh, in Apache Druid today. Above, above this amount of rows, you might wanna make two clusters. Um, 
uh, anyway, so um, there's a query server called the broker. Um, like I said, Druid speaks SQL. Uh, the broker is actually the piece that does speak SQL and it translates the SQL query into what we call a native Druid query that every other server in the cluster can understand. So there's this one server type that speaks SQL and everybody else understands a much lower level uh, native language um, that's more operator, um, it's, it's more physical operator oriented and less logical than SQL is. Um, and we call this process uh, query fan out because a, a query starts in the broker, fans out to every data server that has data relevant to that query and then fans back into the broker. Um, okay, so now that's, that's as far up as we go. Uh, and now I wanna go down. So let's go back to, back to the segments and then we'll start zooming into the segment and talking about how um, individual segments are structured uh, and how queries execute on those individual segments. So back to segments, back to these 1 million row data files. Um, this is uh, an example segment. Um, it, this one has eight rows in it, not 1 million, um, but that's only because I can't put a million rows on a slide. Uh, so just, just pretend. Um, so there's eight rows in this segment. Uh, this, row, this segment has five columns, time, artist, city, price, and count. This is sort of a, I guess, a pre-COVID data set of uh, ticket sales. Um, and uh, so there's there's three different artists in three different cities, and this data set is uh, how many um, how many tickets were sold for each artist in each city, and what the total price was. Um, okay, so uh, I want to look at a few columns, column by column. Like I said, this uh, uh, Druid is a columnar database, um, and uh, in like all columnar databases, we store each column separately, and each one has its own kind of encoding, its own kind of compression. Um, and is, is uh, in terms of locality, is all stored together in the same place on disk. And so it can all be loaded into memory together and all be transferred to the CPU together. Um, in, uh, so these are all the timestamps that we've stored. Um, they're all the same in this example, uh, likely because in this example, when we ingested it, we chose to truncate timestamps to the hour, or truncate them to the day or something like that. Um, so they're all, they're all the same here. Uh, these are going to be stored probably with table encoding, which is a, one of the ways we can uh, encode integers. We do it for integer columns that are low cardinality. Um, so it'll likely be only a bit per, um, one bit per column, or oh, sorry, one bit per row. Um, the next column is artist and the artist column is a string. It has three sections. It's got a data section. Um, there's also eight uh, values here. There are eight values in the same order as the other eight values. So every column has eight values. They're all, they're all, um, you know, row zero, row one, row two, up to row uh, seven. Um, so there's, uh, this is a, uh, in the artist column, the first three rows are Justin, the next two are Kesha, and the next three are Miley. Um, really uh, very data musical references, but what can you do? Um, uh, there's a dictionary section. So all of our string columns are dictionary encoded, um, which is useful. And I'll talk about that a bit later about why it's especially useful. Um, and then we have an index for each of these columns and the indexes are bitmaps. We use um, either concise or roaring for uh, the bitmaps. Uh, generally these days we prefer roaring, that's the default today. Um, and uh, one of the nice things about these is they can be stored compressed and they can be combined, they can be intersectioned and unioned in their compressed form, um, which, is, uh, which is really cool. Um, then finally, we have all the other columns. All the other columns are, like I said, there's every one is gonna have eight values and, and they're all gonna be stored the same order. So if you wanna retrieve row three, you would read the third value out of every one of these columns. Obviously that's not a very efficient way to retrieve a single row, um, which is why these kinds of layouts are used for databases where people wanna do aggregates over big chunks of data, as opposed to where people wanna retrieve single data points. So when, when data shows up in the indexer and you're building this, Right, like you have to wait till the, the, the segment is full, then you run your pass on it to decide you know, how to you know build the dictionary, right? Because you, you can't know all possible yeah, that's true. You, you see ahead of time. Before you sort of freeze the data in the segment in compressed form, is it accessible through like the, the execution engine for, for queries? Uh, it is accessible. It's um it's in a row store then that is in okay. memory and doesn't use this format at all. Um okay. it's a pretty common technique using columnar databases okay. uh, to have a, a row store that, that flushes to a column store. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yep. Uh, okay. have... So, yes. Question? Uh, if you have the bitmap indexes, why do you need the data segment? Can you reconstruct the data you need from the index? 
Uh, you can, um, but storing the same data in two different ways is useful because we might want to uh, do different things with it. Gen generally, if uh, I'll go through an example query where this will hopefully be eliminated, but in general, if you're going to be filtering on something, it's faster to use the index. And if you're going to be um, grouping on something, then it's faster to scan the data section. Um, okay, so that's that's a really good segue into this next slide, which is let's do an example query. Um, let's let's go through uh, how Druid would do this query on this this one segment basis. Um, so in this SQL query, we are going to group by city. Um, we are going to add up all the prices, uh, and we're going to um, for R equals Justin. So we just want to see for Justin what are all the cities that people bought tickets in, and what was the total price for those tickets. Um, okay, so the first thing we're going to do is um, we are going to resolve the where clause. Uh, and we're going to do that um, by looking at the dictionary first. So we want to figure out what is the dictionary code for Justin. Um, and we store the dictionary sorted. So JKM, these are in lexicographic order. And uh, we can do a binary search through the dictionary to find any particular value. It doesn't really matter much here. There's only three values. A scan would be pretty quick as well. Um, but in situations where there's 10,000, 100,000 million values in a segment, then the binary search really helps us out. So we're going we're gonna to binary search through the dictionary. We're going to see that Justin is 0. Um, and then we're going to head on over to the index and get the 0th entry. Um, the index uh, is the same cardinality as the dictionary, and the values are in the same order. Um, so the, uh, the zero thing in the index is uh, the bitmap for Justin. And you see the, the, the first three um, uh, positions, the first three bit positions are ones here, and the rest are zero, signifying that, that um, this particular column has Justin in the first three rows, and then the other rows it doesn't. Um, Next, what we're going to do is we are going to um, head on over to the uh, city and price columns to do the group by. And so we're going we're gonna to read them both at the same time. And here, we're going to use a data section instead of the index because we have the row numbers that we want to read. We know we want to read rows 0, 1, and 2. Um, and the fastest way to read 0, 1, and 2 is to look at the data section. Um, so we go to the data section, we see that the first one is uh, two, and then the price value is 1800. Then we see one and 2912, and then two and 1953. And we add all these up into a uh, scratch space. Uh, that's scratch space that we've allocated out of the processing memory pool from a few slides ago. Um, there's a few different ways we might do it. We might use a hash table here. We might use an array here. We might use a heap here, depending on whether we're pushing down the limit, depending on whether we know the cardinality to be large or small. Um, in this case, because um, the cardinality is small, there's only uh, three values of city, we're going to use an array. Um, so this is actually just going to be a, uh, a long array, um, so a 64-bit in array with three elements, 0, 1, and 2. Um, 0 is going to have nothing in it. Uh, 1 will have 2912, and 2 will have 3753. Um, then we're going to go to the dictionary after reading through the column. Um, after reading through both columns, we're going to go to the dictionary and replace all of the dictionary codes with the names. Um, and we do this on a per segment basis because every segment has a different dictionary. And so in order to merge results from different segments, we have to, um, at this point, after we've aggregated the data for one segment, we have to then replace it with the dictionary uh, with the name. Um, so now we have L, E, and S, F. We ditch the null. Um, we ditch zero. We don't look it up in the dictionary because it didn't exist. Uh, it was not found. And then we have the final result for this segment, which we will then go on to combine with the results from other segments and then return it to the broker. Um, and this, this, I think, illustrates the, the power of this particular format. Um, the, the awesome thing here is that in order to do the filter, we never had to read the data section of the artist column. We only read uh, a dictionary. We did the binary search through it. We did a single random access into the index. We didn't even do a search in the index. Um, and then to do the aggregation, we knew which rows we had to read. We knew we had to read the first three. Um, we did it using an array instead of a hash table. Um, so much smaller uh, per, per row cost. Um, and then uh, after the aggregation was done, then we uh, replaced the IDs with names from the dictionary. We only had to do that one time per unique ID. We didn't have to do it once per row, um, which in this example does not matter that much because there's only three rows and two IDs. But a more realistic scenario would have millions of rows and maybe hundreds of IDs. Um, so there's a big uh, boost there. Um, 
Okay, let's see. Uh, so that's what I wanted to say about um, that. And then I wanna move on a little bit to um, one more zoom level down, blocks within segments. So now uh, that was 10 to the six, that was one segment, now we're 10 to the three, 1000 rows. Um, every, each of these segments is split up into blocks um, of not exactly a thousand rows, but uh, of that order of magnitude. And I'll talk a little bit about why we do that and why that matters. So let's let's think about one column within that segment. This is that artist column. Um, and in this artist column, we had a data section that had eight rows in it. Um, that eight's not really enough for uh, talking about this concept. So let's pretend it had 16 in it. Um, so let's pretend it had 16. Uh, I made up a new one. Um, and let's pretend that each of these blocks is four rows instead of a thousand. So here's a segment that, um, that has four blocks in it. Each block is four rows. In reality, there would be many more blocks. Each block would be about a thousand rows, but you know, bear with me. Um, and the first three rows are uh, Justin, and then there's some Kesha's, uh, then some Miley's, and there's some more stuff. Then there's another Kesha, another Justin, another Miley, another Kesha, and so on and so on. Um, so data layout is really powerful and, and it helps to think about these blocks when you think about data layout. Each of these blocks is individually compressed. Um, and because each of these blocks is individually compressed, uh, typically we use LZ4 for this. Um, when uh, each of these blocks is decompressed, um, we must decompress the entire block because uh, LZ4 is not an algorithm that enables random access into a compressed, um, into a compressed payload. So what we do is we read a block containing about a thousand rows, we decompress that block, um, and then we're able to operate on, on any of those thousand rows uh, relatively cheaply because the block already decompressed. Um, the idea here is let's say we're filtering an artist. I'll go back a slide. Let's say we're filtering an artist. Um, let's say we're filtering on artist equals, uh, um, let's say Kesha. Uh, so if we're doing that, then, um, we have to read three of these blocks. We have to read three blocks uh, because the first three blocks have ones in them, the last one doesn't, so we don't have to read it. But we have to read a block if it has even one row with a particular value in it. So we have to read these three. Um, that's three blocks that need to be decompressed. And again, we have to pay that, that cost to transfer those blocks from disk to memory, from memory to CPU, to run LZ4 on it. Um, and then we can decode the one row that we wanna read. But that's a lot of cost to pay to read just one row. Um, so if we uh, sort, um, we can address this by sorting. We can address it by sorting on artists. Um, of course, we can't sort on every column at the same time. That doesn't really make sense. So typically people choose to sort on a column that uh, is something they're commonly gonna be filtering on or commonly grouping on. Um, so let's say that, that in this data set, we're gonna, you know, let's say we're Ticketmaster and we're almost always filtering on artists. Um, so if we're almost always filtering on artists, then we might want to sort based on the artist in that way. Um, uh, here, now when we're, we're filtering on any artist, we never have to read more than two blocks because all the Justins are clustered, all the Keshes are clustered, and all the Miley's are clustered. Um, and clustering things this way minimizes the number of blocks to read, gives us better data locality, and speeds things up quite a bit. Um, I have a little example of how that, uh, of a real world example where that actually helped a lot. Um, uh, so I mentioned Druid is in Java, written in Java. This is a, what we call a flame graph. Um, this is created with a tool called uh, SJK. I think it stands for Swiss Java Knife. Anyway, it's a, it's a, cool, um, it's a cool tool that uh, this is a profile of a query that was running. Um, uh, in this situation, um, this is a query that was running on a time series data set uh, with a bunch of sensors, a bunch of facilities. Um, and uh, you can see that 90 plus percent of the time being spent here, the tops of all these, these stacks in the flame graph is LZ4 decompressed. So we're spending a ton of time decompressing things um, and uh, very little time doing anything else. And this is a pretty uh, common thing to see if you have a data set with poor data locality and you're filtering into a small slice of it, which is the case here. We had a data set of a bunch of sensor data from a bunch of different facilities, uh, industrial facilities, and uh, the particular data set, the application wanted to filter onto specific sensors and specific machines and specific facilities. And so it was grabbing a point out of this block, a point out of this block, a point out of this block, and you get a, a flame graph like this. Um, when we changed it to cluster the data uh, by machine, 
Um, so all the sensors are the same machine and the same facility together in the same, uh, in the same segments in the same blocks. Um, the overall CPU time for a query went down by 8x. So the query's got 8x faster or equivalently, that could be the same speed on an eight times smaller hardware footprint. Um, and you can see that the LZ4 decompression part of this flame graph is, uh, it's not, I don't know, eyeballing, it's maybe 15, 20%, uh, much smaller than 90 plus percent. And so this is a much more healthy looking flame graph where we're not spending all of our time uh, decompressing blocks just to retrieve one or two points out of them. Um, so let's see. Uh, uh, finally, um, so finally I wanted to, to talk about one single row. So going down to 10 to the zero rows, uh, one row. Um, on one row, we're doing type-specific compression. So for strings, we're doing dictionary encoding. For integers, we're doing uh, potentially table encoding, uh, potentially delta encoding, delta encoding being uh, encoding differences from a base value. Um, table encoding, meaning there's a small number of unique integers, and we are going to um, give each one dictionary code. So we could do dictionary encoding for integers as well as strings and then data dependent packing. And what I mean by that is we're, we're uh, packing into a certain number of bits based on the range of data encountered in that segment. So if, if in a given segment, we encounter data that, that spans uh, a range that could be packed into six bits, then we'll store six bits per row. Uh, for indexes, we're using borrowing bitmaps, like I mentioned. So this type specific compression being used there. Um, and for layout, the value of each, each value of a row is being spread across all the relevant columns. So we sort of explode each row um, which increases the cost to retrieve a single row by quite a bit, but that's okay because we don't really need to retrieve a single row. That's not really what we're, what we're trying to optimize for. We're trying to optimize for um, scanning large chunks of data. Um, and that this, this exploded storage format is really useful for that because each uh, column can be loaded separately in the memory. Um, and then rows that are likely to be queried together can be clustered together within those columns, uh, leading to really good um, I guess, flow of data from disk to memory to CPU. Um, Sorry, what is table encoding again? Table encoding is, uh, it's the same as dictionary encoding, but in, at least in Druid parlance, um, when we do it with string, we call it dictionary encoding. We do it with, uh, law, with the integer, we call it table encoding. Okay, uh, okay, but it literally is like, I repeat the same digit over and over again, so I'll store it in you know, a, a, a mapping from that with a code to what the actual real value was. Yeah, it's like in this in this column, it's designed for, um, it's most useful for uh, for integer columns where the integers are um, IDs of some kind. So, yeah. you know, maybe, maybe you have a customer column and a customer ID, there's a hundred customers. Yeah. Um, and, you know, maybe the, and it, maybe the numbers are really wacky. You know, maybe you give them all like random numbers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. we'll, we'll crunch them down to zero to hundred. I understand. Okay. Yeah. And then your data dependent packing, yeah. that's just bit, that's just bit packing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, bit packing for on, on the scope of one column. Um, so whatever the spread of data is for one column determines the number of bits for that column. Um, okay. So that's, that's what I had prepared. Uh, and if you want to stay in touch, if you're interested, follow us on Twitter, uh, which we are at. Um, check out jura.apache.org, the project website. And again, if, if you are hiring and apply, um, imply.io slash careers. Um, thank yeah. you. And I think we have some time for questions. Yes, awesome. So I will applaud on behalf of everyone else. Uh, so I always have questions. So uh, let's, let's open up to the audience first. So I know Hamid has a question, but there's somebody else uh, in the chat. You want to unmute themselves? I can unmute them. Uh, Ewal, E Y A L, German. Go for it. Hey, hi, hey, Jen. Uh, so I just wanted to see if you can talk a little bit about how the uh, columnar architecture represents itself in the in, in the in the data storage. Uh, where exactly is the separation um, to to different? Uh, to, to different uh, uh, columns, is it in the file? In, uh, uh, sorry, is it in the block level, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, so um, good question. Uh, if you think about each segment as being its own miniature database, which I think is a good way to think about it. Um, uh, I mean, I guess technically if you had, um, it's a good way to think about it because if you, if you did only have a few million rows to query, then you would only need one segment. That one segment would be the entire database. So if you want to think about it that way, 
um, then uh, it's all stored in a single file. And in that single file, every column is laid out um, end to end, and then they're all stretched out in a line. So the first column might occupy bytes zero through five megabytes, and then five megabytes through eight megabytes might be the next column, and then eight through 12 be the third column, and so on and so forth. Question? Um, if you have a really, oh, sorry. Okay, go for it. Hi, Gian. Uh, my question was, I know, I know you're talking about uh, dictionary encoding for the string columns, right? I know it makes sense when the cardinality is very low. What if, if my cardinality of the particular column is very high? Even in that case, are you guys going to do the same uh, dictionary encoding? Or what are the cost implications in that aspect? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we are going to do dictionary encoding uh, in that case as well. Um, and I guess the follow-up question is, is that a good idea? Yes. Um, <laughs> And uh, I guess um, it, it, it depends. Um, what are, I guess, what are the alternatives? I guess, I guess the main alternative is to store the high cardinality string um, you know, in line in the segment. Because if you think about the, the way the dictionary works, the dictionary is sort of like, a, internally, it's sort of like a pointer. Um, so, you know, we have uh, dictionary code zero is a pointer to a location in, um, uh, a location in, in the dictionary that, that has that string. And then one is a pointer to a different location, and two is a pointer to a different location. Um, and you could store those things instead of pointers, you could store them inline. Um, and storing them inline has the advantage of having better locality than storing them as pointers. Um, so it might be a good idea to store them inline. Uh, it might be an especially good idea to store them inline if they are always a certain length. And so maybe if your high cardinality strings are UUIDs, well, I guess that's a bad example because those are integers really. But if there, if there's something else that's uh, if there's something else that's a fixed length, um, it might make even more sense to store them in line. Uh, it might be a good future improvement to Apache Druid. Okay. Uh, I, think we, I, think, I think just in conclusion, I think what we do now is, I think that, I mean, I think it works, but the main downside is, um, the main downside is, is you, you're not getting a ton of benefit from it and you might get better locality if you store them a different way. Okay. We do Ben next and then Aaron after this. If you have a really large data set, um, which has a bunch of segments, and you want to do a query that only touches a handful of rows, do you get issues with having to fan out to do a random lookup on the index of every single segment? Um, so let's see. That there's, I guess, two. There's two scenarios there. Um, one scenario is uh, where you are filtering on something that is uh, a way that you've partitioned or clustered the data. Because I, I mentioned, I talked about how clustering is useful within a segment, but clustering is also useful across segments because data can be clustered into segments. Um, and if, uh, thinking back to this artist example, this ticket sales example, if you partition your data across segments based on artists and then they're filtering on artists, not only will the data be clustered within the segment, it'll also be clustered across segments, meaning that of the you know, million segments you have, maybe only a thousand of them have data for a certain artist. And the system does know that and can prune the list of segments to scan uh, accordingly. So that's that's a scenario where um, where uh, you're not going to get very much overhead at all. Uh, another scenario is if you're filtering on something that you have not clustered by. Um, if you're filtering on something you have not clustered by, then we do have to look at every segment. Um, and in that scenario, it's there, there's some more overhead, um, which is why clustering is so important. And it, I mean, it's, it still is going to work fine if you're filtering by something you're not clustered by. That's that's actually the scenario we designed for. Like it, the, the intent of Druid is that you should be able to filter on anything you want. That's why we have these bitmap indexes and everything. Um, but there will be somewhat more overhead if it's, if it's something you're not clustering by. Okay, awesome. Aaron. I've asked him to unmute. There you go. There you go. I'm unmuted. Yeah. So, um, so I mean, I, I pretty much wrote it in the, in the question there, but uh, on dare I say a larger cluster, um, if you have that moment where you're like, you know what, we really should have done this differently from the get-go in terms of you know, very commonly used uh, columns, is there anything more efficient than going back and just in chunks doing re-indexing jobs, doing the hash-based partitioning? Uh, no, that's, that's the best thing I know of too. <laughs> I think that if, if you if you have a, a ton of data loaded, if you have an absolute ton of data, and yeah. you decided you wanted to purchase it differently, then 
you are going to need to go through and reprocess everything. Um, okay. uh, I think that that one of the nice things about Druid is that um, it does have this this you know th this is this goes back to that um, that space we occupy on the storage compute aggregation spectrum. Um, one of the nice things about the space we occupy is that you can scale up the cluster temporarily to do and reindex something like that really rapidly, and then scale it back down, and that works fine. Oh, uh, are are you talking about in terms of like the indexers? Yeah, yeah, you oh, can okay. add a ton of you can add a ton of them temporarily. If you're in a if you're in a public cloud environment where it's easy to do that, um, then uh, you can add a ton of those temporarily, do the job, and then you can turn them all off, and it'll be okay because um, the stuff is going to be in deep storage and will get loaded by other servers. Gotcha. Yeah, thanks. All right. Next question is Bali. Yeah. Hi. Uh, are there any plans to support uh, high precision arithmetics or uh, aggregations on Druid? Um, uh, let's see, high precision arithmetic. You mean like like uh, sort of SQL fixed. style fixed decimals? Fixed decimals. Yeah. yeah, the fixed decimal ones, where the precision is of uh, utmost uh, importance. Like you, you cannot be off by like a digit or so. Yeah, it's um, it's hard to talk about plans in an open source uh, project because um, you know it, it's a uh, that's not really how that's not really how Apache collaboration works. But um, there are certainly people talking about it. If you go on on the GitHub uh, Apache slash Druid and search for uh, decimal types, you'll you'll see some active conversations. So it, it's something that's that's certainly being talked about. Okay, great. I, I'll follow up there. Thank you. Floppy disk, this might end badly. If you're a real person, ask your question. Yeah, um, so, you know, maybe your last answer kind of touched on this too, but I'm just wondering, are you guys thinking about the, uh, the Apache Arrow project at all and how kind of some of its aims might play with what y'all are trying to do at Druid and kind of future directions of things? Um, funny you should ask. Uh, uh, yes, uh, we are thinking about it and talking about it. Um, Apache Arrow is very interesting. Um, it's, uh, um, it's, it's of course, similar to the Druid segment format in some ways and different in other ways. Um, I think the Druid segment format is a, a better fit for what we use it for, which is the thing, you know, long-term storage. Um, the, uh, the Arrow folks have a, um, have a page on their site about Arrow versus Parquet and the differences between them. And a lot of that applies to Arrow versus the Druid segment format as well. Um, you know, one being Arrow being designed for 100% memory, uh, and then uh, Parquet being designed for long-term archival storage and disk. And, and the Druid segment format is kind of a blend between them. It's it's um, something that that is at home on disk, but also is at home in memory. Um, and uh, is uh, it's it's well anyway. There's that. Um, I think as to where Arrow could be especially interesting and where we're actually thinking about incorporating Arrow into Druid potentially is um, for transferring data between servers. Um, I think that for something that you're going to read a ton of times and have on disk and memory maps, Arrow is maybe not the best choice, but for data that's, that's generated once and then going to be transferred to the server and then read once, it, it's, um, it, it seems to be a really good choice and, and uh, have less overhead on the right side than the Druid segment format does. Druid segment, um, because of um, all the compressions they're doing, uh, reading is quite fast, uh, but the writing is is fairly slow. Um, so we, we push a lot of work to the right side. And with with these intermediate, with transient data that goes between servers, you don't want to do that. You want both to, you kind of want to, um, you're willing to, you're willing to sacrifice some footprint for having really high speed on the right and read side and Arrow's good at that. So it might make sense to blend them together. I, I don't know if that answers your question, but um, it does. Thank you. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. So next question is Steve Moy from the Steve Moy Foundation for Keeping It Real. Hi. Uh, since this is implemented in Java, I'm very interested in if there's an experimentation running on the Amazon Graviton 2 instance where it has excellent memory bandwidth. So I'm kind of interested on that. Um, I don't know of anyone that's done that, uh, but it would be cool um, if you do it. Give us a holler. Okay, so me, do you want to ask your questions you had at the beginning? Okay, so any comparison with what Druid at Cloudera and also comparison with ClickHouse? Um, yeah, so the Druid at Cloudera is 
relatively similar to Apache Droid. Um, uh, I'm not sure, by the way, I'm not sure if you're asking about the difference between Imply and, and Cloudera or Apache and Cloudera, because I guess I could represent either one, but um, I, yeah. none of the, th of, of the three, I don't think any of them are incredibly far from the others. The differences are uh, at this point relatively modest. Um, so I, I think that, that that's how I'd answer that question. Um, the imply ones tend to be a bit more up to date than the Cloudera ones. I think the Cloudera one is, is somewhat older, um, but other than being older, I don't think it's really diverged terribly much. Um, and then with ClickHouse. Uh, ClickHouse is um, also cool. ClickHouse is a, is a commoner data system that's, that's pretty neat. Uh, I think that um, as it relates to how individual queries get processed and the, and the data formats, it's actually very, Druid and ClickHouse are pretty similar. Um, uh, as it relates to the distributed um, system design, they're a little more different. Um, I think that, that ClickHouse to me has more of a flavor of a strong affinity between data and server. Um, and Druid to me has a weaker affinity and, and that comes out in, in various ways as you think about how to operate a system and scale it and that kind of thing. Um, I feel like the weaker affinity in Druid makes it simpler to think about how to make things elastic and you sort of just add more processes or kill processes and that kind of stuff. Um, and again, at the same side, uh, I think that the stronger affinity in the ClickHouse world makes it easier to think about how to run a very small setup that might only be one or two servers. Um, so uh, yeah, that, that's I think what I would say there. Okay, thank um, you. But, but a very interesting system. So I, I, for everyone, I posted in the chat, This we had the ClickHouse guys come give a talk in uh, May last year for, the, for the, the quarantine talk. So if you're interested in learning more about ClickHouse, you check out there. Um, so I'll finish up. I guess I'll last, ask my last question. Um, you didn't really get into a discussion of like how the, the the query engine actually is reading this data, um, especially when you're doing like long scans. Are you guys doing like any like cogen or vectorized execution techniques, or is it just uh, the Java code to sort of you know doing the standard interpretation that, that sort of Postgres does? Yeah. So uh, we're doing vectorized queries. Um, uh, I, guess, I didn't mention it much because it seems like table stakes these days for an analytics database, um, but we are, yeah. we are doing it. Um, uh, we are not doing cogen today unless you count what the JVM itself does, which it, it, I guess you could, you could think of hotspots JIT as a, as a sort of cogen. Um, yeah. uh, but we're not, we're not, we haven't implemented anything on our side explicitly in the cogen realm. Yeah, okay, okay. Uh, Hamid is asking if you guys are doing joins, but I think you've already said at the beginning you, you guys do support join. Yeah, we do support joins. Um, we don't support every kind of uh, uh, every kind of uh, I guess shape of join you can think of. Um, so the hit, uh, the heritage of Druid is is to be sort of on this fast analytics side, uh, powering interactive apps, that kind of stuff. And it historically fact to fact joins have not been super important. And so we don't support like a shuffle join or a sort merge join. Um, we support hash joins and broadcast joins. Um, I think at some point we will add support for all that kind of stuff because I, I feel like the natural evolution of every database these days is to support everything as, as you get more and more users. Um, sure. But uh, it's, it's also important to, in your journey towards supporting everything, remember what you actually want to be really good at and what we want to be good at is this interactive app stuff. And the broker, that's all, that's all like custom or sort of not custom, but like that's just that's Druid code, not like you're relying on CalSite or something like that, right? Like you divert your own query optimizer? So the, yeah, good question. Um, we, the fan out stuff is 100% Druid. Um, the SQL stuff is using CalSite for the optimizer okay. core and for the parser. Um, mm -hmm. And then on the Druid side, we like the code that we have integrates with CalSite to uh, basically like teach CalSite how to how to generate native Druid queries is is pretty big, so we've yeah. CalSite's really nice in that it's it's got a very very extensible optimizer, um, and uh, it's a, it's a great project, and um, we are making a lot of use of a lot of its of its features in order to have its optimizer generate query plans that make sense for Druid. Yeah, so I, a bunch of people told us they they only use CalSite for people parsing. It sounds like you're using it for it's all like for the parsing and and the planning. Yeah, other, than fan up, other than the fan piece. Okay, awesome. All right, guys. Uh, so with that, we are done. Again, Jean, thank you for doing this. Appreciate you being here.